You welcome back. This is News File, your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. I'm Samson Ladia Yenini, and my take is a call on you to help Shraj and the OSP fight corruption. You have a duty, according to our constitution in Article 41, to help combat misuse and waste of public property. That's corruption. The constitution enjoins the state to take all necessary steps to eradicate corruption. If you find the state is not doing enough, it is because you are also not doing sufficiently well. The Crusaders Against Corruption, that's a civil society organization, together with Imani Africa, Ghana Integrity Initiative, and the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, have reignited the discussion and pushing for something to be done. The Citizen Movement Against Corruption, and as you have known, Occupy Ghana has also been on the subject matter of the Conduct of Public Officers Bill 2022 for a while now. <clears throat> that bill was introduced in Parliament many years ago, over a decade ago. In fact, you remember Emil Schultz. Emil Schultz, as head of Shraj, helped to ensure that the first draft or what was turned into that draft was made and submitted for the purposes of turning it into a law and it is supposed to replace the very 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 i'll be careful the words i use useless piece of legislation that says Declare your assets, but you are declaring it in a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, and you take it to the Auditor General. The Auditor General has no right to open to check to verify if what you have brought is an empty sheet of paper. The Auditor General has no clue what you have put in there. If you have stated that you have a house, you have two houses, and you are supposed to also declare your debts, your liabilities, it has no idea what you have put in there. So you could actually put in there that you own four houses. As we are beginning to learn that Cecilia Dapa, there is going to be some petition to the right authorities about the properties that she holds in her name. All acquired within a certain period when she has been a public servant. And I'm not sure if they are checking with the people that they have put before the court for stealing, but they may be supplying information to people, very useful information as well, about her worth and how much she carries in millions. And they, we got to know that the OSP has made a significant discovery in making the searches in her property. Now, for those who are rising against the OSP for whatever reason, I have no idea why they should be, you know, uh, against the OSP for seeking to fight corruption. Some are suggesting that it actually doesn't have power. I don't know which law they are reading, but the OSP law is just too clear about the OSP's power to investigate corruption and corruption-related offenses. I don't know where they are reading. And those suggesting that the USB has done something wrong and must be arrested and prosecuted. I don't know what's going on with this country. But as we know, when you fight corruption, corruption will fight you. The OSP has done absolutely nothing wrong in the process and is continuing and deserves our support so that it will get to the bottom of this matter. Our constitution is very clear. 
that if you are a public officer and you have declared your assets, if you make further acquisitions, or if a matter occurs and you are asked, you must be able to establish that the property or the asset you have is reasonably attributable to your income. That's your salary, or if you have some you know, business. Reasonably attributable to your income. Reasonably attributable to a gift. Maybe you got it as a gift. And we can trace gifts to tell who <coughs> gave the gift to you. It doesn't matter if it was your brother's gift in a box and your brother is dead and your brother who is dead gave it to your mother, your mother who is also dead who gave it to you. It doesn't matter that you think that because they are dead, there cannot be a trace. That's, that's, that's false. It doesn't hold. There will be a trace. So either it is reasonably attributable to your income, to, your, uh, to a gift, to an inheritance, to a loan, or uh, to a source that we can vouch for. So I call on all of us to support the civil society organizations, Crusaders Against Corruption. They are new on the block and they have joined this fight. The Citizens Movement Against Corruption, CMAC, Imani Center for Policy and Education, the GACC, Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, the Ghana Integrity Initiative, the local chapter of the Transparency International, the Occupy Ghana, and all other CSOs that are fighting for the conduct of public officers bill 2022 to be passed into law in a manner that is useful. In the military regime, in Rawlings's regime, when you declare your assets, they are published with the state as in the assembly press. They are gazetted. So any citizen can go and pick a copy and check what you have declared. Then if you have made acquisitions that they don't find on the list, they will raise an issue. And people raised issues and investigations were done and property confiscated. We can do better in the democracy than we are doing now. So this new bill, if it will not allow for verification of the assets so declared, and if it will, not allow, it will not allow for publication of the assets so declared, we shouldn't have it at all. It will be as useless as the existing one. And the MPs who have been fighting against it, they need all of us as citizens to rise up and to tell them to their faces that it is how we want it that will be done. Those who are rising with petitions to various places, that is the best thing to do. I was sad last week when I spoke about the um, Whistleblowers Act. That gives you power to blow the whistle. And people were very cynical. They couldn't trust any of the institutions listed in that act to blow the whistle to. Please, don't do that. Blow the whistle nonetheless. And the law will be used to protect you. Once you are doing the right thing, you can count on the support of the law. I say we should do this. In respect of Cecilia Dapa, let all those who know the whereabouts of her properties, beyond those we are hearing have discovered about four properties, two different story buildings acquired within a certain period, let all begin to blow the whistle. Inundate the offices of the OSP, the offices of Shraj with these uh, whistleblowing and let them do their work. If we don't do it, this country will remain what it is now. The corruption is very pervasive and you are getting almost nothing despite your hard work. That's my take. Now, we'll take a quick break, return, I introduce my guest. We go to Niger, come to the Bank of Ghana and to the economy of this country and to ask questions to about how a whopping 200 million of your money 
has been sunk into Saglime and it's been abandoned all this while. Just like what Kufour did, then the NDC came, they abandoned their affordable projects and decided they wanted to do a new one, STX. We know where that ended us, right? Guess what? If you sit back, it's your money. It's not their money. It's some money from their pocket. And in fact, some of these projects, they do them and turn around to buy them. They're not doing it for you, in fact. We'll be right back. Regarding certain foreign partner powers, we, like the overwhelming majority of the people of Niger, were surprised by their eagerness to condemn the seizure of power by the National Council of the Safeguarding of the Country to pronounce sanctions against Niger and its people and to put a de facto end to their security cooperation. This hostile and radical attitude brings no added value neither in the resolution of the new situation born of the seizure of power by the National Council for the safeguarding of the country nor of our hitherto common fight against terrorism. The political instability in Niger is a source of grave concern for us all. It threatens our shared vision of a peaceful, secure and prosperous West Africa, a vision that is impossible to achieve amidst political upheavals and disruptions to constitutional order. The task of restoring democratic governance in Niger is fraught with potential hurdles and complications. However, we cannot afford to be hamstrung by these challenges. Instead, we must confront them head on, drawing upon our shared experiences, wisdom, and the strength of our collective resolve. ECOWAS has given um, the Janta a one week ultimatum to Hanover or face severe consequences, including the use of force. After the one week, we will seek the direction of the presidents exactly what they will do. But I can say that the member states are ready. Uh, if it means using force, the member states will be ready to do that. I, I, armed forces, I can, I can assure you that the professionality of the Ghana armed forces is, is par excellence. And I'm not worried at all, not, not at all. I, 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 don't, I don't worry about any member of the armed forces taking up arms to say I'm going to remove a government. No, not at all. They would rather protect the will of the people. They would rather not allow anybody to cheat in an election. They would rather not allow anybody to manipulate in an election. But to take up arms to remove a government, the armed forces are, be, right. they are they, no, it's, be, it's beyond that. Armed forces of Ghana is far beyond that. Right. Um, so as uh, Dominic Nitu, the defense minister, was talking about the intervention, uh, which will be for the protection of the will of the people, the question that has to be asked is, in Niger, what is the will of the people? They are on the streets, and there are thousands, and they are very, very jubilant about what has happened. Their country is responsible, that small country, is responsible for a third or more of the illumination of France, uh, the, the, the lights, <laughs> the power that is there. But in their own country, we're told a very small number of that population has seen electricity, that they are responsible for a third of what powers uh, France. Right. I'm joined by Professor Kwesi Director, Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research, Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Kwejoa P.J. Chia is Associate Professor, School of Law, University of Ghana, Legon. They are our guests helping us to briefly look at the issues coming out of Niger and the attempts by ECOWAS, of course led by its uh, leader, Bola Tinibu of Nigeria, uh, to seek to take some steps there. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for making time to join us this morning. Yes, uh, Professor Edin, thank you very much. Um, first of all, do you, as I ask in my introduction, do you think that Africa is back 
to the era of military regimes or we should continue to treat these as isolated situations. I referred to a study that uh, showed that Sub-Saharan Africa uh, has experienced 80 successful coups and 108 failed coups, coup attempts between 1956 and, nine, and 2001. And that says an average of four coups in a year. And as we know, when coups were rampant, they were staged in the name of corruption, mismanagement, and poverty. Well, the reports are replete that these problems are worse today. There is, there is devastating poverty, particularly in Africa. And African governments are happy to just attribute it to um, COVID and, and sit back. So what do you think? Um, if you have a population, you know, 500 million, that's half of the population is in poverty. And when it comes to the survey in 2019 and 2020, Afrobarometer uh, survey about corruption. The people believe that corruption is pervasive and yet there is a scare to report for fear of retaliation. And the survey in the year again uh, revealed that 42%, only 42% of people in 19 African countries believe in removing non-performing governments by the ballots. So, so what is that? Is it the, is this the new trend? Are we going back to military regimes because the problems or the reasons or the justifications used for these regimes are back and even worse than the days when uh, the coups were staged? Well, Samson, um, thank you very much. I want to make some preparatory remarks. Um, it is not just the Afro Barometer report that paints a disturbing picture um, of corruption in the most general democratic reversal. If you look at the, the statistics or the indices from the Ibrahim, the Mo Ibrahim Index of African Governance. Uh, just published a couple of weeks ago, the five indices that they use, civil society, security and safety, media, uh, freedom, um, anti-corruption policy, and then abuse of office. All of them as compared to the figures from 2019 have seen a dramatic, you know, reversal. Meaning that the spin-off of democratic transitions and democratic growth are not as positive over the last decade as one would have wished. Do the cases of Guinea Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, point to isolated cases. I don't think so. I think since my last study that drew the conclusions in 2020, September, that there would be about five coups or so, those projections have come true and the conditions that led to those upheavals considerably well after 2020. So I think it's dangerous to presuppose that these are isolated things. Furthermore, the very nature of geopolitics and strategic imperatives of the Sahel and West African states have shifted dramatically so that those who play critical roles are not the same people 
or the same thing, the critical role probably five years ago, ten years ago. So we need to understand the drivers of the change, dramatic changes. And what are those? One relates to the demographic and the capacity of government to speak and respond positively to the shifting sound of the democratic expectation of what demo democratic governance is about. Number two relates to a very false narrative about the importance of particular states as linchpin states in the fight against terror. Now, that is a false narrative emanating from capitals in Washington, London, Paris, and elsewhere. Linchpin states are states that must first and foremost seek the welfare of their citizens. I cannot be a linchpin state in which the nature and character of the security force assistance that you provide serves only your interest. So if you look at the six countries that have all presented this false narrative of Niger as a linchpin state, then you ask yourself, is the fight against terror and the perception of Bazoum as a friend of the West does it inure to the benefit of ordinary people of Niger, or Bazoum has, has become something like a house slave, a lucky, who dances to his master's tune without delivering public service goods to his people? Furthermore, we are seeing, as I said earlier on, a realignment of forces, friends, um, logistics, all sorts of things. So these are not isolated cases. People are reading into the shifts and the changes and are saying, to what extent can we exploit some of these shifts and changes to our benefit? Two last points. When I heard what had happened in Niger. I asked myself two very simple questions. Where will you and I be having this conversation again if and when this happens? Because there will definitely be another one. The second relates to what are the lessons that we are learning as member states of ECOWAS and the African Union in ensuring that we can proactively prevent these developments of the future. Now, I've always argued, and, I would, and that argument will become even more important, that when you become a member of an international organization and you voluntarily sign on to binding instruments, in which those organizations are incapable of eliciting compliance and behavioral change from signatory states, then those international organizations must begin to look at other instruments for engaging their member states. And you mentioned corruption. You mentioned poverty. Out of the 250 million Four people on this continent, about 200 of them are chronically poor. So the basis for the joy that we see on television depicting what is happening in Niamey is that ECOWAS and African Union should begin to design graduated and incremental responses when they see that member states are beginning to slip 
in terms of their, their upholding the rules, the norms, and the principles that they have signed on to. The NEPAD process had such a checklist, but NEPAD, for some strange reason, is not very much on the front banner, and therefore, we don't really hear of NEPAD very well. If ECOWAS and the African Union continue to be reactive, then I think the efficacy of those organizations will, will be reduced over time. Right. Uh, apart from uh, situations like, uh, you know, uh, Conde's situation where after having been in power for 10 years or more, you know, sought through, you know, engineering a constitutional amendment so that he could stay on power, you know, for a third term. We had the uh, Yoweri Museveni issues, uh, Alassane Ouattara issues like that. Apart from those issues, when they, are, they, they keep the refrain, uh, corruption, mismanagement, and poverty. Uh, if you check with um, uh, Mamade, he said, he said, and I want to quote him, he said that poverty and endemic corruption, these were the reasons that he, he gave, poverty and endemic corruption. Um, we had, you know, the guy in Mali also talking about theft and bad governance, theft and bad governance. Um, the Sudanese and Zimbabwe generals who toppled Omar al-Bashir uh, in 2019 and Robert Mugabe in 2017 also made similar comments. So it comes down to the governance that produces, as it were, uh, food on the table. But we know that military regimes don't provide the answers to these. So what do, you, what do you think, first of all, that if the, the leaders are listening and there is a way out? No, there is a way out. But there are a couple of challenges to get to the way out. Now, those who take up arms against the state will always find all kinds of excuses, some of them legitimate, most of them not. And let me make this point also, that in talking about cookism is because, and I like the point you made, are the leaders listening? Were they to listen? These are desperate cries for changes in the character and the quality of governance, because perceptions do play a very critical role in how citizens look up to their government. Perception is very key. Now, we also know that could uh, undermine the military as an institution itself. So if you talk to a number of serving and retired men and women of armed forces, they will tell you that coups are not good for the institution itself. That being said, the onus lies on those who have willingly and on their free will come to the populace and giving their word on their honor that they will work tirelessly to deliver public service. When the public perception begins to shift, that the promises that were given were either false or were deliberately manipulated, knowing that the promises could not be kept, then it raises the question as to whether that process that led to the victory does not undermine constitutionally because it was based on hype. And I think that is what the Liberian president, George Ria, is talking about constitutional coups. 
And I think he's, he's consistently been very concerned that there are ways and means in which constitutions are undermined and overthrown in which gangs are not involved. So I think we need to broaden our conceptions and understanding about... They're referring to uh, George Weir. He, yes. This is the statement that is attributed to him. Um, I understand from a certain quarter that there's some denial of it, uh, but oh, this, is a statement, this, <laughs> this is a statement that is attributed to him, uh, quote, as long as ECOWAS tolerates institutional coups that allow lifetime presidencies and fraudulent declaration of election results, manipulation of judicial announcements, there will always be military coups. And we cannot condemn military coups when we do not condemn those who carry out institutional coups. ECOWAS should work for the interest of our peoples. This is a statement that's attributed to him. But like I said, the, there is uh, some uh, reports that it is being denied. But now my question to you before I go to Dr. APJ, Professor APJ, is this, that we understand that while some predict and project that Africa must prepare itself for the eventuality of more coups in the coming years, um, it is expected that for strong or countries with strong institutions such as South Africa, Africa's most industrialized, uh, Ghana, Botswana, um, may not be, you know, may not suffer such fate, but the poorer and more fragile states, and poorer and more fragile states, Mali, Niger, Chad, uh, Guinea, uh, where we have seen these things repeat themselves. 15 of the 20 countries topping the 2021 Fragile States Index are in Africa, including Cameroon, Central Republic, uh, Africa Republic, Somalia, South Sudan, um, as well as a few uh, larger nations, we are told, like Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia. So, and, and of course, uh, Nigeria is also mentioned in there, uh, our most populous country uh, in Africa. So, whilst those who watch these things say, we should expect that this will continue, they are careful to say that there are certain countries which are poorer and weaker which will face this. But there are other countries that have uh, stronger institutions that will not face uh, this. What do you say? No, I think <clears throat> there are always exceptions. So, for example, you see both Benin and Togo making fairly positive progression towards strengthening, strengthening institutions um, opening the space for more collaborative political engagement and activity. Then we see probably until recently the most stable West African state, Senegal, over time deteriorating to such an extent. The last week or so, the opposition party was banned, the opposition leader on trumped up charges thrown into prison, and you begin to wonder the calculus from, from Matisal in pulling back from the brink for his third termism and the sudden decision to clamp down on opposition politics. My argument is that the timing of South's behavior is closely linked to the fortunes of the Wagner Group. I will not be surprised if something happens and South says, look, the situations have changed and I want to run for a second. Okay, so we need country-specific analysis and understandings of the actors who are involved in some of these political processes and political decisions. But even for a strong country like South Africa, we realized at a point in time that there was the state capture by the Gupta brothers. But when you have strong institutions, 
individuals who are members of these institutions who are willing to put their reputation and sometimes their lives on the line. Then it becomes a contestation between the pecuniary interests of particular groups in this country and then other individuals who are speaking and working for the larger group of the state. So there are always these contestations in also in Ghana, in Botswana, in Namibia. You know. So my assessment is that while these democratic reversals will continue, you will see also a pushback from our institutions and democratic forces insisting that governance be improved, that the quality of life be improved, that security and development must go hand in hand so that people will see the benefit of the democratic, of the democratic intervention. Right. Um, so let me still have you just for a minute. Um, yeah. We know that the, you know, ECOWAS leader, Bola Tinibu, president of Nigeria, um, is, you know, taking steps and calling on the, the community for solidarity towards reversing what has happened in uh, what has happened to uh, Mohammed Bazoum. Now, yeah. we have the nodding senators of Nigeria, of course, because of the closeness, and we understand that um, these uh, people, uh, the, the population in Niger depends heavily, you know, on some importation as far as food and other things are concerned from Nigeria. Um, the, 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 they share border with uh, Sokoto, uh, Kebi, Katsina, Zamfara, Jigawa, Yobi, and the Bono uh, states. And they say that the manner in which ECOWAS is seeking to intervene will adversely affect the country and may even lead to a certain, uh, you know, war in the, in the sub-region. Um, so they believe that their approach should not be military. It should be talking. Uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Libya, you know, also they believe that will be affected if military force is used. You don't share that view? I will nuance it even further. Um, you know, for those who know their history of West Africa and the way ECOWAS was established, led by Gowon and Achampong, our own late Colonel Achampong, and if you read Achampong's speech at the inaugural, at the inaugural meeting, of the Kowal. Those military heads of state who met were driven by a larger sense of community and integration and understood or their advisors made them understand the complexity but also the interdependence among these different nations. Because beneath the nation state are the, are the sub-nationalities that crisscross our boundaries. And if you get me to your studio one of these days and you put a map of West Africa on the screen and I'll show you the caravan path, the villages and the towns where people are, then you'd understand the, the admonition for caution. Nigeria's biggest dam, the Kanji Dam, was built because there was an agreement between Niger and Nigeria that Niger should not dam its portion of the Niger River. So you may want to cut off electricity now, but that goes against the established interest of Niger. That's number one. Number two, I think I understand President Kilimu very well. New president, democratically elected, he has a challenging course. Um, you know, he needs 
he's not the equal set. Yeah, but, but, but Prof, he has his own problems, does he not? Um, his, 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 yeah, legitimacy, yeah, his legitimacy within Nigeria itself is, is being is a, is a subject saying, of a challenge. A, and a and, and Nigeria, Nigeria has had to declare a state of emergency, you know, because people are going hungry. The population is not likely to support, you know, wasting, spending extra money uh, for this particular purpose and so on. Yeah, so just give me the chance to explain. That was what I'm, I'm coming to, that he has a case in court. He's a new president. He's a new chair of ECOWAS. He needs to be seen to be doing something. Okay, taking into consideration his own domestic challenges. Mm. So you would notice that when the president met and they gave one week, the one week ends tomorrow. Now, the question then becomes, when the president met, were their military chiefs with them? And was this conclusion based on the advice of their military chiefs? But three processes have already started. So ECOWAS has sent two missions to Niamey, you know, to start the process of getting President Bazoum out of house arrest. That has not been successful. The president of Chad, who himself is not constitutionally <laughs> elected, uh, was also sent. So that the intervention and the actions here and now seems to be almost contradictory. Mm. You know? And they realize the caution and the advice. So look, based on our history of interventions and coups, then let's begin, you know, backdoor channel in which we move from a will lose to a right. win. Okay. Let, let's, and I think that is what will happen. Okay. Let, let me bring on Professor Apiyeje to you now. And, and Prof, could it also be, as others suggest, that these African presidents, particularly in ECOWAS, who are in a hurry, you know, to support um, a reversal of the situation, they are just puppets of the West, France, and we know that particularly that France will suffer because of this situation. Um, so they are not likely to support uh, Mali and Burkina Faso, who have, you know, declared intention to join forces with the uh, Niger to fight, if anything of the sort, you know, was done. I can assure you. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> more often than not, because of the nature of our politics, we tend to think, ah, these guys, they don't know what they are doing. I just want to give you two examples. When ECOWAS intervened in Liberia in 1989, Perez Dequeya, the Secretary General of the UN, said he could not consider Liberia and the ECOWAS intervention because the UN agenda was poor. But Bangida and Rollins decided that they will intervene with our scarce resources. I can tell you that our military chief and some of the less you know, trident advisors of our president will ask for caution. Because the military chief, they know the arsenal. They know the history of France. Mm. They know the history of the U.S. The United States moved its troops out of Niger when four counterterrorism uh, experts were killed. Cameroon is in war right now. The U.S. has pulled out the support that it was giving to Cameroon. So our military chiefs, yes, they will do what is best, but they will also put on the table options in which the military option will be the very last because mm. they know it is their life and the life of their men and women All that right. will be on the line. All right. So your, your last word before you take leave of us, do you sincerely believe that if... Niger's uh, junta keeps to its stance. The, the agenda, as it's being discussed now, to strike will happen? No, it will not. It will not? Striking will be the absolute last you know, option. It has, not, it has not happened anywhere there has been a military takeover. Why should it happen in Niger? 
because of the geopolitics that I'm, I've been talking about, the multiple interests and the embedded interests. Let's not forget, China has put in 4.6 billion. China is building the longest pipeline, okay, to get Niger oil to the coast. So the interests are massive, and I think a military strike may not necessarily reverse re what is taking place. All right. Negotiation mm. will, will take us much, much, much further. Lives and also Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kwesienin, Director, Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research, Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Kujia uh, Piedje, Associate Professor, School of Law, University of Ghana, uh, joins us. So, uh, uh, Prof, there were questions I was putting to you, but I got uh, Prof Sainin to, to speak about them briefly. Can you also uh, share with us what, where you stand on this? Is it your thinking? that the reaction of the African leaders, particularly in ECOWAS, is just to serve the, the, the purpose of the West and uh, those other, you know, foreign countries? Thank you very much, Captain. I, I think that that point is very, it's a very uh, fair point to make, that African leaders want to serve the interests of the West. Because so far we, we can observe the kind of rhetoric coming from these countries about the, the, the West, anti-Western sentiment. And so if you look at the landscape of Africa at the moment, we realize that we are going back into the bipolar world period, the Cold War period. And now even people are talking about a tripolar world, mm. the West, Russia, and China. And so countries are beginning to align themselves or realign themselves. If you look at what happened in Russia, when Russia recently called the Russia of Kasamik, realize that a number of African countries did not take part. It is an indication of the realignment we're talking about. And so you have countries like Ghana and others that are strongly opposed to the war um, in, in Ukraine. And they are also, in this context, opposed to the coup d'etat in, in, in Niger. So as it is now, the West has already indicated, for example, the U.S., how much money they pumped into Niger and how they want to ensure that Bazoum remains in power. So you can see the geopolitics coming into play here. But apart from that, African states themselves, especially West African states, I also try to fail to recognize that when there is a coup d'etat, it is not only about the fact that there is an unconstitutional attempt to change government, but there are also other unconstitutional changes in government which point in the face of African leaders that there is a problem with maladministration, there's a problem with corruption, there's a problem with bad governance. Because when you look at the Lomé Declaration on Unconstitutional Changes in Government, it, it talks about coup d'etat, yes. It also talks about um, changing government through mercenary activity. It talks about changing government through civil war or coup d'etat. These are where if you can say violence is involved. And these are where governments come to power through unconstitutional means. But there are two more. The fourth one is where a government refuses to leave office after losing elections and therefore fighting for power sharing and what have you. The other is where a government decides to change the constitution or to doctor it in order to stay in power beyond the two normal two-year time limit. And that's what we call third-termism. These are the two factors which remain, um, as Professor Amy was referring to, if you look at the Mo Ibrahim indices, if you look at Afrobarometer and so on, are, are issues that are occurring and which is creating that illiberal democratic environment in many African countries. We are sliding on the democracy scale. And that is scary because uh, it connects to the Afrobarometer survey, which says that. Majority of people are willing to accept 
military takeover, takeover. and this is about 56%, and the majority of these 56% are youth. So if you factor in the general democratic environment the world over, if you look at um, Europe, you will see far-right parties coming to power in countries that a few years ago nobody would have imagined or envisioned that a far-right party would come to power or be a kingmaker in, in the politics of those countries. Nationalism and patriotism um, 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 or populism are also influencing the, the, the dynamics in, in, the, in the African context. And so I, I strongly agree with um, Professor Enning that the environment is changing in such a way that you cannot guarantee democracy at this moment. And then uh, more coup d'etat may occur. And now in Niger, the West has come to realize that if we say that we are just abandoning Niger, then we are allowing Wagner to come in and take over. And, and in fact, it's true, U.S. has spent a lot of money in terms of security in Niger. And so they want to protect that interest. But rightly so, China is also in, in, in Niger. They also have their interest to protect. So it, it, uh, the geopolitics is, is, is ripping, uh, rearing its uh, ugly head very fast, especially in, in West Africa. And we need to be therefore very careful about how we tackle this issue. It is not to uh, make a, a rash decision and say that we're going to Niger to, um, to overthrow the government uh, and restore democracy. It is easier said than done. But I think African leaders would want to pander to the interests of the West and say that this is what we, do. we, we, we support this idea. We want to go in there and, and, um, and make, make a statement. If you look at the whole of um, um, changeover landscape in Africa, it is only more, um, 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 Sierra Leone through ECOMOC and Comoros some time back that there have been military successful attempts to change government and to return the overthrown government to power through um, um, after a coup d'etat. So it is important to look at the dynamics and to adopt a more pragmatic approach that can find a solution to this uh, coup d'etat issue which is coming up. And I can tell you more may come if we don't sit up and realize that Unconstitutional the government is not just about coming to power through unconstitutional means, but trying to stay in power and trying to foment um, 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 uh, divisional interests and so on to, in order to maintain power and rely on corrupt governance to stay in power. That is another recipe for more coup d'etat to come. Oh. Uh, coups may be expected, but particularly in poorer and fragile African countries. Now, whilst the excuse, as you also uh, reiterated, has to do with, you know, corruption, mismanagement, and poverty, that democrat democracy is not delivering the dividends. There is also no guarantee that military regimes will deliver the dividends anyway. In any case, it's been found that in the majority, military, reg uh, uh, military regimes have been really bad, and democracies give us a better space to develop. Um, yes, the corruption is pervasive, as the uh, Afrobarometer reports all show us, uh, survey in 19 countries. You and I sit in this country and we can play the ostrich that we don't see. Of course, people will normally, when it suits them, they will say uh, matters of uh, courts. But we know that courts don't always exactly determine the truth. Uh, people, ordinary people, can see the corruption. They can see it. They can feel it. They may have difficulty in tracing the exact source of the corruption. But we sit in this country and we can see it clearly. A party comes into government. This particular party has been in government for a while now. And we know people who didn't have anything. 
who have certain suddenly become millionaires in the country. And you may say you can't accuse specific people because they will be, you'll be taken to court. But the people are seeing it. Do you think that the leaders in these democracies are taking any lessons that this same matter of corruption, which is the biggest mismanagement, which also leads to poverty, is what will make them suffer? Well, in the first place, let, let me say that military regimes don't come in to solve any problem for any country. If we just take the example of Mali, Burkina Faso, and, and Guinea Bissau, they said that they came to power because of the security situation, and they'll make it better. Has it become better? Certainly not. A, a second issue they also raised is corruption. Has corruption been dealt with? Certainly not. In fact, some statistics indicate that the situation, the, the military situation, or the city situation in Burkina Faso, for example, has been made worse since the time the, the military regime came to power. And so, military coming to power don't necessarily solve the, the problem. And I think I've made a point, and I will say this again, that sometimes a coup is necessary, but with a caveat. Where there is no means to change government, where there is high level of instability, where the, the country is tearing apart, a coup d'etat may be justified. But those that orchestrate the coup should not have in mind that they want to take over the regime and rule. They just want to restore democracy. Mm. So after a coup d'etat is uh, successfully undertaken, immediately steps should be taken to um, return the country to democracy. And the military will go back to Paris. Uh, well, the military <laughs> is said to be an apolitical institution. Their place is a barrack. Their place is security. But where we have a situation, which is also very important to note, where the military and the security forces, the role they play, when we have governments that are corrupt, when we have governments that are only interested in their, in furthering their own interests while in power, the support they get from the military and the, and the police is also something we need to take careful attention to. All right. Because unless, unless the, they, they get the support of the military and the police, they cannot stop people who want to go on demonstration, who want to use legal and human rights based approaches to question government and to change government. So if they want to go on demonstration and the police, the power of the police unleashed on them to, to disrupt the demonstration, to shoot at people and so on. The military and the police are supporting the regime. And for that matter, where some excesses are committed by these security agencies in the country, the government also keeps quiet. For me, a good example is the Akama situation, where clearly, constitutionally, on human rights grounds, the military was at fault, but the, the government was not ready to condemn it. And up to now, nothing has been done for the people of Atama. All right. So we need to take that into account. Mm. And then the corruption issue, we also need to consider that people, that is why um, Transparency International brought about this perception uh, idea. Because it is difficult to take a corruption issue to court, especially if you apply the criminal law approach. And so increasingly, we are going by the human rights law approach where people express themselves and a level of perception that you come, they come out of it should be an important indicator that corruption is a problem and that if it is not tackled, it may lead to the consequences we are having in this country we're talking about. Mm. The fact that a country has strong democratic credentials doesn't con con uh, guarantee that there could not be a good time as a country. All right. Because, because if you look at the example of Senegal, uh, Makisal has, in a few number of years, completely turned the democratic fortunes of Senegal. When there were a number of coups d'etat in Africa in the 60s and 70s, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Botswana, 
were some of the few countries that had or maintained strong democratic credentials. But Machisal has turned everything after that in a few weeks. And the possibility of a coup d'etat in Senegal cannot be uh, okay. Alright. Thank you very much. Uh, Kujia Piaje Chia is Associate Professor, School of Law, University of Ghana. We take a quick break and when we return, Dr. Theo Champon, Political Risk Analyst and Economist, Isaac Adongo, MP Boga Central and Member Finance, Trade, Industry and Tourism Committees of Parliament, Dr. John Ampontia. Kuma MP Ejusu and Deputy Minister of Finance will join us to check how exactly the corner has been turned. Hey, welcome back. This is News File. See your most authoritative news analysis platform is brought to you by the kindest sponsorship of Bank of Africa. As strong as a group and close as a partner, empty and everywhere you go. Ashesi University. Educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Robert and Sons Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care service provider for 31 years. Duraplus, how you get your water matters. Remember where Duraplus goes, water flows. DBS Industries, roofing, papa pa fee. My way, dial star 165 hash on MTN to join my way today. Cherry tree properties. We develop spaces as though we were going to occupy them ourselves. Syntex tanks. It's strong and it's tough. Flamingo paints. Simply superior. There's a couple of your messages here. And Opoku Asamoa says that Opoku Asamoa says, um, Ku is not good, but our leaders continually justify this act. How on earth will the government of Ghana owe vendors of SFP but receive their fat monthly salaries? For ECOWAS, the least said is better. Someone's election is contested in the court and he is elected as what? Um, K. Amwa says, if all efforts of the teeming experts in Africa are focused on developing economies and its people, I do not doubt Africa will be the best place to live. Dr. Park Clement says, why is ECOWAS considering a military intervention to restore democracy in Niger when three other uh, nations in the sub-region where democracies were overthrown, did not attract the same reaction from ECOWAS. Where are the principles? Honestly, I think such a move will be counterproductive with dire consequences for the sub-region. says, I think anybody who supports a coup d'etat does so because they believe they have nothing to gain from the prevailing democracy in their country. Whoever is confident that there could be, there could not be coup in their country must therefore do a research as to how many people in their country believe they have anything to gain from the prevailing democracy. <laughs> Those who stage coup d'etat would often gauge the mood of the people whether or not majority <clears throat> will support takeover of power. Um, Musa Abatoa says, I'm not in any way in support of coup d'etat, but the unprecedented coups we are seeing today is a result of corruption and mismanagement. For instance, what's happening under Akufuado and Baumia, uh, Baumia government where public office holders are keeping their foreign money in their bedrooms appear no different from what is happening in Niger. Please, they keep it in a box. That is also a place to save, isn't it? <laughs> they keep it in a box. <laughs> uh, people buy all sorts of jokes here in this country. Um, now, this one says, let's let the people decide what kind of leadership they want. If ECOWAS is interested, 
so-called democracy over the welfare of the people, ECOWAS has lost its legitimacy. Alhaji Suleiman uh, shared that one. And that will be my final message. Or I should just read this. So African leaders are a disgrace to humanity and puppets of descendants of our colonial masters whom our forebears chased out of Africa. Right, now, let's go check if um, we have managed to, as it were, turn the corner as far as the economy is concerned, as uh, trumpeted by Ken Oforiata, the finance minister, and opposed by the minority in parliament. Let's go to parliament to listen to this and return to the studio to my guest. Mr. Speaker, total oil production from all the producing assets within Ghana was approximately 18.5 million barrels from January to May 2023. This translates to an average production of 122,000 barrels per day. Total gas exports to the gas processing plant at Atuobo and the onshore receiving facility. Mr. Speaker, uh, the cash waterfall mechanism and the natural gas clearing have been used to equitably distribute revenues in the sector. Under the updated ESRP, the cash waterfall mechanism is being reformed to ensure mandatory compliance to provide cash flow predictability to key players, IPPs and state energy entities within the energy sector. To address the impact of excess capacity payments on the economy, government has sustained collaborative engagement of IPPs. Currently, IPPs are being engaged to restructure their accrued outstanding balances and eliminate payment shortfalls and areas accrual in the sector. The gas sales agreement between VRA and NGAS has been re renegotiated to reduce the take or pay commitment and other financial obligations to the state. Key revisions to the macro fiscal target for 2023 year include 1. Overall real GDP growth rate of 1.5% down from 2.8%. Non oil revenue GDP growth rate of 1.5% down from 3%. End period headline inflation of 31.3% from 18.9%. Primary balance on commitment basis of a deficit of 0.5% of GDP compared to a surplus of 0.7% of GDP aligning with IMF supported primary balances. Gross international reserves sufficient to cover at least 0.8 months of imports of goods and service by 2023. Mr. Speaker, revisions to GDP or projections the overall real GDP growth for 2023 has been revised to 1.5% from 2.8%. And non-oil real GDP growth has also been revised to 1.5% from 3%. The downward revision in projected growth for 2023 is an indication of a broad slowdown in the three sectors of the economy as a result of factors such as the fiscal consolidation plan and difficult global conditions. Mr. Speaker, Overall GDP growth is, however, projected to rebound to 2.8%, 4.7%, and 4.9% in 2024-25 and 26, respectively. With the economy showing signs of stabilization, government intends to pursue a growth agenda that is fully aligned with the 2028 timeline for returning to a path of debt sustainability. Mr. Speaker, given the limited fiscal space, as well as our determination not to accumulate new areas, our growth agenda will be mainly financed from domestic and external private sector investments, as well as a rationalization of ongoing programs. The approach is to prioritize existing programs that are critical for growth and can be implemented to deliver quick results without huge demands on the available budgetary resources. Ultimately, we will aggressively encourage the private sector under the Ghana Mutual Prosperity Dialogue Framework to promote shared growth anchored on job creation, food security, exports and import substitution. 
Towards this objective, government expects to finalize a growth strategy in August 2023, an enhanced growth strategy that is. Mr. Speaker, the key elements of the enhanced growth strategy include accelerating, scaling up and aggregation in agriculture and value addition for key staples such as rice, poultry, maize, soya and tomatoes, supporting industrial parks and economic zones that promote innovation and positive spillovers and efficiency for key sectors such as the automotive, pharmaceutical, technology, textiles and garment industry, promoting tourism to attract international and domestic tourists to boost incomes and create jobs, deepening the digitalization of public service to promote efficiency in service delivery and protecting the public purse, expanding housing delivery programs to improve access to jobs and accommodation, and deepening financial intimidation intermediation programs to enhance inclusion and entrepreneurship. Ghanaian women had agitated strongly that this media review should address a very important matter, a matter that borders on human rights. And Mr. Speaker, I recall that you also spoke emphatically, which was well received by the Ghanaian people, that a media review should abolish taxes on sanitary parts. It is an embarrassment that such a gross human rights issue if you compare the price from the foreign sanitary pad, as I speak, it's 15 Ghana cities per one. The local, government, uh, the local companies are preparing or producing this particular sanitary pad at the cost of 11 cities. And I want to add, ask Honorable Abrakwa, should we actually collapse the local industries in this country? This government owes road contractors about 15 billion Ghana cities. That is an example of collapsing businesses. That is lack of jobs because these contractors, Mr. Speaker, 70% of the contractors are not on site. So which project at all is going on as we are talking about? We are in a terrible state. What the minister is telling us is that he should be applauded for increasing the feeding grant in terms of the nominal value from 9 to 7 pesos to 99 persons. Mr. Speaker, the same finance minister indicated to us that inflation is at 54.1 percent. Mr. Speaker, let's be realistic. The students are here. Who in this country today can afford to produce what the Ministry for Gender, Children and Social Protection describes as a hot, nutritious meal per day? You're welcome back. So we were in Parliament, and my guest, Isaac Adomo, MP, Bolga Central, and Member of Finance, Trade, and Industry, Tourism Committees of Parliament, John Ampontia uh, Kuma, uh, is MP, Ejusu, and Deputy uh, Minister for Finance. Theo Champong is Political Risk Analyst. I'll begin with um, Isaac Adomo, who is right here in the studio, uh, the NDC. Uh, did not even wait after the budget was the media review uh, process. Did not even wait for a minute to begin to criticize this as, you know, a government that is not learning from how it has destroyed the economy. Why so? Uh, good morning to you and to your listeners, particularly my people in Bogatanga Central. Uh, good morning to Dr. Kuma, my good friend. Uh, Samson is a very difficult situation. The finance minister had a very bitter pill to push down the truth of this country. And he needed to find a sweetener to make it, uh, make it easy for us to swallow it. So the language and everything was quite clear that we were being told that this was an economy that he was paying tribute that was dead. At the end of the day, it is not easy to pay tribute of somebody who dies but didn't live a good life. 
So it was very difficult. So at the end of the day, it was quite clear that this was a difficult uh, funeral dirge that the minister was singing. And I'll give you a very simple uh, analogy. If you have an economy where it had grown by 4.2% by June, of course you expect that that economy will continue that trajectory. Then they tell you that the economy is now going to take a downward trend and will end the year at 1.5%. It's akin to going to Kumasi. And you are very quick to get to Nkoko. But from Nkoko, you are actually reversing to come back to Bunso to restart the journey. How, who does that? How can you move from 4.2% to 1.5? Some say if you have a taxi driver who, who earns annually, say, 400,000, and he does 200,000 half year, and another 200,000 half year, the two gives him 400,000. What the minister said is that by June, that taxi driver had increased the revenue he got last year of 200,000 by 4.2%, which is about 840 Ghana cities. But his total income at the end of the year will be 1.5% of the two put together, which is the 400,000 by 1.5. His total income at the end of the year will be 600,000, uh, 600. What it means is that from that point, he must make losses of 240, so he'll end the year at 600. Well, he earned 840 already. You expect this person who has been told that the 840 that has come to you is not for you, and that you are going to make losses, you are going to take your car out, most of the time you will come home and you don't even have the fuel you sent out there and you have to go and borrow to buy fuel the next time, and you return without the money that you used to buy the fuel. That is what is going to happen to you from now till the end of the year, so that you now will earn 600, and not 840 you earn at the beginning, at the middle of the year. If this is not a funeral debt, you are singing to this person, what are you singing to that person? Did he not speak to facts when he said, quote, the economy is showing signs of recovery. The exchange rate has stabilized. Inflation has softened, and interest rates have declined since December 2022. So why was he not quoting the figures? You see, this is a clever, what is softened? What is moderated? Quote the figures, and we will understand. Mm. So in December, inflation, mm. inflation was 41% in May. It increased to 42% in June. That should tell you that inflation is on an upstick. And nobody celebrated 42.5% of inflation. But it was 54.1% at the peak in December 2022. Why? He wanted so he's saying it has declined, and that is a fact. No, I'm saying that if you had 54% uh, mm -hmm. and you think that it should remain there, then you are not a manager of the economy. Let me tell you why inflation will remain elevated. I'm giving you these numbers from his own budget. Year-on-year mm. -year growth. Currency outside the banking sector, the monies that they pumped into the economy, are not in the banks. People are redrawing the money and putting it in their rooms, in their boxes, and under their, their, their beds. That alone grew by 44.8% in 2022, just one year. Half, half year, June of this year, it has increased by, it has grown by 41.3%. It means that in one and a half years, over 86% of the money in the banking sector have left the banks. This will put further pressure on inflation. That's why inflation is on an upstick. You have to look at the fundamentals that are driving the numbers. If you were giving me downward growth in these numbers, then I'm seeing that your inflation will be anchored and that you are beginning to solve the problem. But the problem still persists and it's been getting worse. Look. Total liquidity in the economy, 2022, grew by 38%. And by half a year, it has grown even more than the total year, by 44.4%. How can you solve inflation with these type of numbers, liquidity numbers? Look, currency in circulation, 2022, it grew by 42.8%. 
And as at half a year, it has grown by 38.8%. Reserve money, 2022, increased by 57.5%. And by half a year, it has grown by 29.24%. These are the numbers that are driving inflation. So if you see these numbers and you are not scared, look, if you get 22, uh, 57.5% increase in your reserve money, what it means is that this must be multiplied by a factor of three to get the money supply in the economy. In other words, your amount of money in circulation grew by almost, I mean, uh, your money supply increased by almost 160% in one year. And you need to bring those monies back in order to solve the problem of inflation. Mm. You took a chunk of that money. You said they should write it off. So how will the money come back? You took a chunk of that. 80 billion, you took it. So for those monies to come back in order to affect these numbers to moderate and slow down inflation, you must pay the 80 billion so they lock that money out and that money is not back in the economy. Mm. You say you can't pay, they should write it off. You said interest rates have declined. Uh, That's also uh, a something fact, that is not a Last year, uh, just uh, a few days ago, were well, you know in this country when the governor increased the policy rate to 30%? Is that how interest rates come down? Government itself is borrowing at almost 30% on 91 day bills. And this report is saying that the interest rate that is charged customers has increased to 35% mm. in its own report. So how can you see the numbers and say something different? Ah, are we not in this country when they, charge, they increase the policy rate? And you know, the rate at which even the government and the Bank of Ghana itself, this 35% that they are talking about is what we call the Ghana reference rates. You know, we used to have base rates. So Bank of Ghana abolished it and said it, it will do a Ghana reference rate so that all banks apply it. If you are using the 91-day the you know, bill, yeah. In December, mm-hmm. it was 36.23. Yes. As we speak around at June, mm-hmm. it was um, 30. No, that's rather if you're using the 100 and um, 182 day bill. Mm-hmm. Right. So it was 35.48 in December. Mm-hmm. And in June, it was 21.77. That's, so that, that sustains, as a matter of fact, what he said. No. You see, even the Bank of Ghana lends at 30%. Okay? The Bank of Ghana itself lends at 30%. So how can you be playing gymnastics? And that is the key indicative interest rates for the economy to, re- to, to respond to. So if the Bank of Ghana is charging 30% only a few days ago, all your other numbers are irrelevant. The man who is driving the interest rate, the Bank of Ghana has responsibility for price development, interest rate, inflation, and depreciation of the currency. That man has come to say it will charge 30%. Mm. All other numbers don't make sense. So how can you now look us in the face and say that was, look, you said that by the end of the year, the total reserve at the Bank of Ghana can only cover zero, can only cover 0.8 months. 0.8 months means less than one month. Now that money assumes that the IMF will give us 1.2 billion and we will not use that money. If we keep that money that the IMF is going to give us, and we'll get the World Bank to give us 540 million. The two together will give us about 1.74 billion. And the IMF is saying, don't throw this money into the economy. Keep it. And they are saying that if they keep that money, that money will cover 0.8 months. Mm. In other words, you don't even have reserves. Two. And so how can you say that zero point less than one month of import cover is what turns the corner, the corner of the economy? To say, to say we have turned the, the corner as far as the economy is concerned is to say that we have passed the critical you know, point and we are starting to improve. If you look at the facts, that supports it, that we have been at a critical point. Um, of course, as you get up this morning and you want uh, you know, kinky that may satisfy you, maybe the five CDs, 
uh, ball of Kenke, unprecedented, will not be enough for you. But he's saying that it could have been worse. This is what he has managed to do. And now, because of the softening decline, we are beginning to improve. You, and I'm saying it's not, it's not declining. You see, but the figures say I'm otherwise. Coming. Your city has depreciated by 20 and almost 30 percent half mm. year. Mm. You should be worried. Mm. Half year. Yeah. And the only source of uh, forex you are going to get is from the IMF 1.2, the World Bank 540 million. Even that put together will, only, will not even cover one month of imports. You should be very worried. But you see, if you come to Parliament and you revise all the targets that will help us to get out of the woods in a ne negative direction, mm. your targets that would have helped us to improve the economy, you have come to say that all of them are completely out of gear. Mm. So how are you going to turn the corner if you, at the beginning of the year, assess the level at which you will turn the corner? And now you have come back to tell us that I can't meet any of them. All right. L let me ask um, Dr. Theo Champ on that question. So, Doc, I have read from other experts, uh, Joe Jackson and the rest of them. Uh, they say, look, reality check. Uh, overall GDP, we, in the 2023 budget, 2.8%. Um, the current reality is 4.2%. And... The revised budget is 1.5. Inflation target was 18.9%. The reality is 42.5% for, 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 as of June 2023. The revision is 31.3%. When you talk about uh, gross uh, international reserves, the 2023 budget, not less than 3.3 months cover. Reality check, 2.5 months cover. The revision, at least 0 0.8 months cover. Primary balance, commitment basis. In the 2023 budget, 0.7% surplus. Now we have 0.5% surplus. Expenditure, allocation, and the rest of them. So everywhere, at every front, reality is pushing us to reduce what we had budgeted. How do you, you know, just oppose that with the statement that has uh, gained currency, turning the corner? This is what would have led you to Get, get to a certain improved status. But what would have led you to get to a certain improved status? You are rather now reducing that. Yes, Dr. Tia Champo. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, it's very easy to, uh, to answer that question. In, in my considered view, something, um, we're still in the corner. We haven't fully turned yet. Um, and I'll explain that with some of the um, indicators, right? Um, we cannot deny that there has been some positive signs of recovery, quote and unquote. Um, and it, it's quite important we understand that. But the frame of reference in terms of some of these relative positive signs is just what's happened in the last couple of weeks and months. But that does not in any way indicate whatsoever that we have fully turned the corner as yet. In other words, when you look at some of the indicators that the government set for itself in the 2023 budget, which was read um, in, in November of last year, and you compare that to what the projections are for this year, clearly you see that there are issues. Because if we had turned the corner, the question then would have been, why are we then revising all these macroeconomic numbers and indicators down? from what we said we'll be doing ourselves. So let's start with the positives and then we'll address the, the other substantive issues. Yes, if you look at GDP growth on the quarterly basis, the number that we have for the first quarter of the year is up 4.2% versus 3% of last quarter. If you look at um, the reserves, which is one of the big issues with CD and the depreciation, the, the net international reserves um, 
was uh, 0.6 months, basically two weeks of import cover as of December last year. That's how dire the situation was. And it's been reported now that it's now gone up to 1.1 months of import cover. So that's, th that's, that's three weeks, right? No, that's 1.1 months. So that's one month and a couple of days on top of that. So we've been able to add some buffer, more or less, to that. If you look at the primary balance, so the primary balance is your revenue and expenditure, but you don't include your interest payments in that. If you look at that, the, re the report shows that um, we have a surplus of 1.1% of GDP versus an original target of 0.04%. And there's public debt and all of that. So these are positive indicators. We, we, we acknowledge that. But you have to do a holistic analysis using the entire budget number of 2023 as the frame of reference. And if you use that as a frame of reference, it is difficult to sustain then the argument that we have what turned the corner. Yeah. Um, because the indicators show very clearly that we have made major adjustments and cuts to a lot of these numbers. Take inflation for, for argument's sake. In the original policy target, inflation should be between what, 6 and 10%. Inflation now is in excess of 42%, right? And it's sticky. It's not coming down anytime soon. Hmm. So you cannot then, you know, on the basis of that, say, because the inflation is 40 or so percent and it's been relatively stable around that mark, we have turned the corner. That argument doesn't wash. Take the exchange rate, CD, again, right? The CD has been trading around 11 or so for some time now. However, if you do the depreciation and you work out the number, right, from the beginning of the year, um, it is very clear. You're talking almost 22, 23% depreciation yet to date. So again, it's difficult to sustain that argument of having turned the corner. The indicators are positive, but we are still largely in the corner and we have not turned in that regard. Lastly, if you look at the budget itself, the, the media budget that the, the government presented, mm. and you look at the numbers that the, the government um, is highlighting in the media budget and what they intend to do, I find it a bit difficult to even accept some of the cuts that are being um, proposed. Because again, my frame of reference is 2022 in the budget. In the 2022 budget, if you look at the, uh, there's a table in, in the media budget, table six. If you look at the adjustments that the government said in the media, or in the original budget, sorry, the government said that they were going to be doing um, a revenue of 100.5 billion Ghana cities. So this is the budget that was read in November of 2021. All right. And they were going to be doing an expenditure of 135.6, so roughly 136 billion Ghana cities, mm. right? And that then means that you had a, a balance or a deficit of 35 billion that had to be financed. In media, they came to parliament. So this is Russia, Ukraine happens. June, come to parliament and say that, well, we're going to be doing now a revenue of about 97 billion and an expenditure of 134 billion, right? And that reflected a cut, particularly on the expenditure side, of going down from 27 or so percent of GDP to about 23 percent of GDP. This is all in the numbers that the government presented. Right. Table three, table five, table six of the mid-year budget. Now see what happens. So we get to the end of the year. And the revenue is still within the ballpark. It's about 96 billion, the provisional outend. But watch the expenditure. The expenditure now jumps from 138 to 165 billion. And if you look at how that is going to be financed um, from the, the budget line items, the original budget that was presented in 2022, uh, in 2021 for 2022, 
there was not going to be any financing of the deficit from Bank of Ghana. It was zero. A lot of the deficit financing was going to come from the commercial banks and other non-banks. Um, there was about 27 billion of deficit financing. Now, what, what happens? At the end of the year, in 2022, the financing now jumps from um, 37 billion now to 65 billion, and out of this 65 billion, 55 billion of that is financed domestically. And within this 55 billion that is financed domestically, the Bank of Ghana pushes as much as 53 billion Ghana CDs into right, the, the economy and um, to support the government's fiscal um, objectives, even against the, the ceilings that the uh, Bank of Ghana Act, Act 612, as amended by, you know, 918. And all of this money and the excess deficit spending basically ends up going to drive a large part of the inflation that we see in the latter part of, of the year. So when now the argument is made that, oh, we, we, we have turned the corner, it, 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 the evidence doesn't really support that case because your frame of reference ought to be what you indicated and said in the budget, the 2022 budget, mm. not what we are seeing in terms of the relative stability that we're, we're, we're seeing here. And I'm sure we'll come to the whole Bank of Ghana argument and all of that. Right. But it is very clear, at least on mm. the surface, when you look at the data and the numbers, that we are not out of the woods yet. All right. Um, Dr. Dr. Kuma, <laughs> so... Okay. <laughs> so you see, the figures as have been thrown out there in the manner they have been, and the, and the like uh, Isaac says, you know, the minister introduces with a sweetener so that people don't exactly feel that this is how harsh the situation is. But people feel it. Like uh, Kufo introduced uh, the term, it's actually in your pocket. That's how people feel it. They, they ask themselves, they, they don't have to ask really, um, what is the worth of my Ghana city? You know, today, if I need to make purchases, how much of it is worth what? You know, and to think that they are dealing with a proud Ghana whose currency is now only like uh, compared to places like is it Zimbabwe about two very terrible terribly performing countries so the 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 claim that we have turned the corner it is expected that people would have taken this and and make a meal of it right uh, well thank you something <laughs> And uh, good morning to your viewers and listeners, and good morning to Dr. Theo, and a special good morning to Honorable Adongo, my good friend. Tell him that I send him greetings from Harry Magua, his good friend. Great. Uh, because today he is playing the, the, the uh, self-scoring goals. Mm. <laughs> from his argument today, he's playing the Harry Magua role. You know, uh, he must always remember that nobody thinks a funeral dead in a white cloth. This is just <laughs> for laughter purposes. I see. Uh, the, John. <laughs> John. John, say, say, I don't know. I, I should say what? I don't know. I don't know. Yes. So it's I don't know. It's oh, not I don't go. Oh, honorable. I don't know. <laughs> Correct. All right. So let's go. <laughs> okay. Great, great, great. Um, uh, so back to the issues. Um, let me start with the, the meaning of turning the corner and how it's been interpreted. Clearly, the Minister for Finance spoke with all humility and he understands the difficult current uh, global and domestic financial situation we find ourselves. So uh, our choice of the phrase turning the corner is not in any way uh, or should not in any way be interpreted to say that we are totally out of the woods or we have seen full recovery. But as you can understand from the 
metaphor. When you when you are driving and you turn the corner, it means you see your way clearer. It means that, that your path is rather now straight to a better destination. So let us not um, misinterpret the phrase when we say we have turned the corner. But clearly, all, all the statistics that the finance minister provided indicate that indeed um, it is better compared to six months ago. It doesn't mean we are okay now, but we see our way better now. A lot of uh, doubts in the air have been uh, removed, especially those who hang their hopes on getting a fund program within the shortest possible time to anchor our fiscal consolidation program and all that has been achieved. Mm. So it is part of the economy. So, so, yeah, yeah. so how, how do you say you see your way clear now? When you have reduced yeah, when, when you have reduced the figures that gave you the hope? Exactly. That's what I'm coming to. Uh, so let me deal with the growth strategy uh, you know, which has been revised in line with the IMF fiscal consolidation part. I mean clearly even though we have achieved 4.2% in the first quarter, we have been, uh, or we have still revised our uh, growth target to 1.5 from 2.8%. But this is in line with the fiscal, contrastionary fiscal policy that we are required to do under the fund program. And so to counter that, government has come, also announced in the media budget a certain growth strategy that was so ensure that we are able to achieve, achieve higher growth outside the fiscal arrangement. And we're going to do that through the private sector. And of course, some support we are expecting from the development partners. And he clearly outlined how we are going to achieve that higher growth. Mm. So uh, I don't think that there should be any cause for alarm. Clearly when uh, the, the figures indicate that even though we are uh, um, targeting low, the reality is that we are doing more. So. Um, there, there should be no cause how, for how, how do you respond to how do you respond to critics who say that there had always been the issue of data credibility you know with the the bank of ghana because it now looks like after having signed on to the imf we have received information that gives you the accurate situation so that According to the 2023 International Monetary Fund Regional Economic Outlook report, Sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana's net international reserves are expected to end 2023 at approximately three weeks of import cover. That is 0 0.8 months. This contrasted with the Bank of Ghana's summary of economic and financial data, which estimated Ghana's reserves for 2023 at 2.7 months of import cover. So now you have seen the clear picture and you are giving the correct figures. Is that not so? Well, but you see, even from the figures you just read, one is net, one is gross. So depending on what figure you are speaking to, you may have questions of why different numbers and different interpretation. So let's be clear on that. Ghana has always been, or let me say the finance ministry has always been honest with our figures. I mean, remember that we are under the fund program. If you churn out figures that are not correct, the country can be uh, punished. For yes, that. and we have so, suffered that before, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and we have suffered that, especially under my good friend's government, uh, on Abu Adongo's government. So definitely we are not churning out any uh, uh, figures that are contrary to what it is. But I just want to uh, go straight to the the indicators that as we have now which indeed point to the fact that we have turned the corner uh, and one of the key things that let me speak to the ordinary Ghanaian to appreciate when we say that we have turned the corner in just december in, uh, fuel cost was about 24 ghana cities today as we speak it's dropped to about 12. this is not to say first this is okay but like i said turning the corner doesn't mean end of the game we, we know that things are in the right path, and we are hoping to make it better as we move on. Also, uh, uh, the exchange rate. We know that it got to a time that it shot to about 15 Ghana cities in December, November, December. And today, as we speak, we are hovering around 10 point something to 11 Ghana cities, which at least we have seen a certain level of stability on the exchange rate, rate uh, front as well. 
And then also on the inflation, uh, clearly we were at 54, we've tapered down to 42.5. Of course, we know that we uh, Parliament recently passed some new revenue measures in the budget, which also got reflected somewhere from May. And so some of the impact from the new measures from the taxes are also having effect on the inflation levels that we are seeing. But put all together, you realize that indeed um, we are better, we are in a better position right now compared to where we were. And we are very hopeful that going forward, before the end of the year, we are indeed going to see a number of positive changes that will reflect in the objectives of government as far as fiscal consolidation is concerned, our debt restructuring is concerned, even on the, so if you look at the expenditures, the finance minister announced that um, even though we had a target to do 227.8 billion in the appropriation, by the mid-year we have revealed downwards to do about 206 billion, you know, and, 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 and then even posting a positive primary balance of 1.2%. Mm. So all these are indicators that we are heading towards the right direction. And we are not saying that that is the, 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 the end. I mean, we have fully recovered and, and everybody should go out to sleep. No, turning the corner doesn't mean that way. It just means that we see our way clearer. We are very optimistic. We have confidence in the measures that we have outlined so far. And we are very confident that by the end of the year, Ghanaians are going to have a better story to tell about the economy and that we should continue to put trust in the government and have confidence that the measures we are putting in place will help us recover better and faster as is expected. Okay. Um, the, now, Isaac, yeah. the, the, the question I get asked is that, for example, when you take the Bank of Ghana situation into it, the question is, from the picture that the finance minister paints, is it actually possible to grow at what we have revised at? Because the central bank is literally broke. Yeah. Bankrupt. Yeah. Bankrupt. Yes, so something. First, I want to make this correction. You don't compare end year figures to mid year figures. Nobody does that. Because in media, the influences are different from India. Your inflation of 54% last year includes the total envelope of financing you did for one year. You cannot compare that to financing you've done for six months. When you have come back initially, your budget, you estimated that you were going to do 64 billion concessionary financing. Now you've erased that completely. You now say you are going to do domestic 44 billion, which was not in the original estimate. It has different implications. So they should stop comparing June to December. December will see the full size of the flop. And you are telling us that now that you say your way is clear, this is how the year will end. And it doesn't look good. So nobody does that in finance. Look, in June, Inflationary figures and numbers are driven by different dynamics. In December, the driver of inflation is most often imports for, mm. for Christmas. Have you arrived there? So stop comparing. What you compare is your target to your reality. And not a full year's dynamics compared to some half year dynamics. That is one. Two. You haven't paid a penny of interest in debt service for this year. So how can you be comparing your private balance and your debt service to a period where we paid our debt service? A period where you have told the whole world that you cannot pay and you are busy begging them to forgive you, you are comparing that to a period where you paid. Mm. Your overall deficit will be different. Your primary balance is influenced largely by how much you have paid or you borrowed to pay for your interest and your debt service. So once you are not paying debt service, you will not have borrowed money to pay that service. Mm -hmm. But you are also not going to be called upon to pay the debt now. So at we, least we don't you, know have, yet, but I'm saying that you have a breathing space. But we are saying that there are two different 
mm. statistics. I appreciate that. Good. Mm. So we should you should avoid these semantics. Try and put through just 30% of your debt service. Let's see where you'll be. So from where you sit, mm. how do we turn the corner and bring the Bank of Ghana into the picture? Samson, we haven't even seen the taillight on the corner. That corner is far away. It's like you are here and the corner is in Boga. How can you see it? These people are just trying to use semantics so that they paint over the reality. You see, the 0 0.8 months is not their figure. It is an IMF figure. And I've told you the components of that 0 0.8. It is $1.2 billion from the IMF. We've got $600 million of it, which has influenced the 1.1 you put there. The other period didn't take that 600 million. You are looking for another 600 million by your second, your first review, hoping that there will be approval in November so that you can get that figure in. And yet in your budget, your concessionary borrowing that included this figure, you have eliminated it, which means you are not even too sure. And then three, you are hoping that the World Bank will give you 540 million. If you put that together, that is 1.74 billion. That is the figure given to you as a target per your program. You have no way of changing that figure. You must meet it. Unless you can go and demonstrate to the IMF that look, with what we are doing, we will exceed it. Then the revision can be made if you can prove it. So you have an economy at half a year being compared to full year. For instance, if you take that to GDP. You have an estimate of the whole year's GDP, okay? And then you put the public debt at this point in time on that whole year's GDP you have even earned. Obviously, the GDP will be bigger. Your debt will be smaller because you have incurred the other debt that you incur to complete and deliver that GDP. So you will see a smaller debt to GDP. If you pick that and say, oh, June, I got 71, and last year I was around 100%. Who are you deceiving? You are basically putting a smaller debt, which does not reflect the total debt that you incur at the end of the year, over a projected bigger GDP. Mm. Certainly, the numbers will artificially show an improvement. You don't carry that one to Parliament to go and say that you have turned a corner that is still in Borga and you are sitting here. You can't even see the daylight of that corner. If you attempt to turn it now, that will be a fatal accident. For someone like you who has been raising issues about the Bank of Ghana yeah. and the issues of our finances with them. What do you say about the current situation? And in my introduction, I said I didn't understand something. Mm -hmm. I wish that you guys can help me understand. That you say about, is it 90% of what is called the loss by the Bank of Ghana is attributable to the DDEP. And I'm saying, from where I sit, the DDEP, I was the one affected mm. because I had my money with you. And you decided that I take a haircut. How does that translate to you making a loss? So what I want to say is that there are laws that govern public finances. And the Bank of Ghana, its own law, under Section 31, says that, look, you have the mandate to lend to government whether in the form of advances, treasury bills, overdraft, whatever instruments. Then 36 says that all the loans under 31 should not exceed 5% of the previous year's revenue. So that's your limit. Mm. Like uh, my colleague said, your total revenue for last year was 96 billion. How can you now be giving 80 billion to government? And he says at any point, this is at the end of the year, at any point, it should not be more than 5%. Mm. Now, this is the Public Financial Management Act. And I want us to take our time and look at some provisions in it. The Public Financial Management Act is an act that was put together to govern the management of public finances and to be a guide to the audit of public finances. And it is supposed to be applied by all covered entities. And this is how the law defines covered entities. So that people understand why I'm saying Bank of Ghana is perpetuating illegality. Under the interpretations, 102, 
a covered entity has been defined. A covered entity has been defined to mean the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. B, constitutional bodies, and Bank of Ghana is a constitutional body. Ministry, department, agencies, and local government authorities. The public service. Autonomous agencies, and Bank of Ghana is an autonomous constitutional body. And the judiciary. What it means is that if you are any of these, you must apply this law. Mm. And there's a provision in this law that says that any time there's a conflict between this law and any other law, this law prevails. Okay. What it then means is that the Bank of Ghana Act becomes irrelevant to the provisions of this Act. And even the Bank of Ghana Act does not provide any exceptions that they have. Under Section 53 of this, the law is very, very clear. And it says, 53 is talking about abandonment of claims and right off of public funds. What are the rules? A. 51A, say the minister shall seek the approval of parliament in A, abandon or remit a claim by or on behalf of the government. Abandon or remit a service to the government. And write, write off of loss of or as of a deficiency in public funds or public resources. Where parliament grants approval under subsection 1, the A and B I've just read. Under subsection 1, the approval shall be by a resolution of a simple majority of parliament. But it provides a proviso. Mm. And that proviso is that the minister may, okay, in accordance with the regulations, abandon or remit. That means the minister can come under a regulation. And that regulation is saying that he can remit a claim or write it off, but he must report to parliament every year by the, the third month. In the regulations governing this act, there is no threshold, which means that any such write off must come to parliament. You see, if we did not do this, this has not come to it, nothing. So the so-called write off of 32 billion is an imagination. The law under 97 provides for surcharge. Look, is there uh, 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 the opinion of the chief legal officer of government on this matter? 32 billion. You can't just go away and write off 32 billion Ghana cities. The, the, the attorney general must tell us his opinion. So what should happen if, as you say, and the minority has been insistent on this, that the law has been breached? Yes. What should happen? So uh, there are certain things I don't want to say. Sometimes your powers are stronger when the person is naked. At this moment in time, we know what will happen if you go to court. So when everybody is left alone, the president is sitting somewhere, attorney general is sitting somewhere, Ken Oforata is sitting somewhere, and Addis is sitting somewhere, we cannot isolate and arrest. At this point, they are together fighting you. So we are very careful to choose our battles. But we just want to serve warning that they must produce the attorney general's opinion that said that this law does not apply to Bank of Ghana, even though Bank of Ghana is a covered entity. In but you see, mm. uh, I need the to other know. issues beyond this technical argument mm. is the fact that there's a reason why we say don't lend recklessly to the Bank of Ghana, because, to the government of Ghana, because it creates what we call fiscal dominance over monetary policy. What it simply means is that it creates a situation where monetary policy like the Bank of Ghana cannot take optimal decisions. Mm. It pumps a lot of money into the economy, like I listed those uh, uh, liquidity issues, All right. and makes it difficult to anchor inflation. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, uh, Dr. Thierry Champong, well, you wanted us to get here first. So what's your take on this matter of the BOG recording a 60.8 billion loss in 2022. And my, my question that I asked, I need some explaining. Help me appreciate it. Yeah, so um, the, the two issues are interlinked. Let me pick, 
pick from where uh, Honorable Adungo just left off with the fiscal dominance issue. Mm. Um, and it's very important that we understand what has happened within the public finances of this country over the last uh, two or so years, right? So originally, like I had highlighted, when that 2023 budget was read in November of 2021, the idea was that you're going to have a 37 billion Ghana financing deficit. And of this 37 billion, the Bank of Ghana was not going to be involved anyway in financing that deficit. The line item there in table six of the um, uh, media budget is zero. It's there, you can see, I think I provided some, some charts to, to your colleagues to put Yeah, we have screen. seen it, we have seen it, right. yeah. Okay. Then, even in the, as of the mid-year, when we came, the amount had moved just a little bit. So there was a, what, a 38 billion gap. Out of that 38 billion, 28 billion was coming from domestic sources. Of the 28, 8 billion was going to come from Bank of Ghana, right? Something happens from July to December. That forces the bank now to lend even in excess of what the appropriations were during the mid-year budget, thereby, in my view, even breaching the provisions of the Bank of Ghana Act and the, the Public Financial Management Act, as uh, Honorable Adongo and others have, have spoken about. So if you look at the number, 55 billion was the financing um, from domestic sources. And Bank of Ghana pushes or pumps in 53 billion as part of this here, right? So if you work the number, that's over 90% of that, or as a proportion of your total financing, 85%. So 85 CDs of every 100 CDs that came in to finance the deficit in 2022 came largely from the central bank because Ghana was locked out of the capital markets. There were the issues even with the domestic market and all of that. But it goes to the point that Honorable Adongo and others of have, have all argued out, right? That there is an overdominance of the fiscal side of things that in a way even pushes or uh, you know compromises, in my view, the independence of the central bank. Because you look at the central bank and their core mandate is twofold in Axis 1-2. The first one says they've got to fight or address inflation, so price stability. And then the second is something related to supporting general government policy and, and related matters, right? Where they can give overdrafts and loans and, and things like that. But in the amended section, Three, one a of of uh, access one. He says that, except as provided in this constitution, the Bank of Ghana, in the performance of its function under this act, shall not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority. This is explicitly stated in the the act. And you look at the people that sit on the board of the central bank in section section four uh, of the amendments, right? from the governor, the deputy governors, all the way to the nine other directors, these are all appointed by the president, right? So you begin to see the conundrum hmm. where the central bank is basically being used to finance the deficit and has become the piggy bank of the state to the point that the original mandate of the central bank, which is to fight inflation, we've lost that battle, right? The policy target, they said, not me, they were going to do between what, 6 and 10% inflation, right? As we speak now, it's in excess of 40. Even the target now this year is not going, the, 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 the provision or the forecast is that it will come down to about 30. But inflation is still sticky. So the, there's a mismatch between mm. the policy making environment. And it comes down to the fact that you've got, you know, the, the state pretty much on the fiscal side of things, dominating everything. All right. And that has led to a compromise on the central bank's you know, own um, ability 
to meet the core mandates of that. Right. And I think the issues that are we need to, again, for me, legally, we need to interrogate. Because uh, Honorable Adungu maybe can speak to this. If you look at Section 30 of the Act, right, again, it says uh, that you cannot borrow or lend more than 5% of the previous year's revenue. But in 36, it says that in the event of an emergency, the governor, the minister, the controller, and an accountant general shall meet to decide the limit on the borrowing. That should be made by the government. And number two, the minister shall submit a report on the issue to parliament within seven sitting days. Question is, did this meeting take place? Number two, was that report ever submitted to parliament? Same thing in the amendment of the act. It says, 16, um, section 16, 7, says that where the loans, advances, and purchases of treasury bill securities is 5%, so when you have paid that target of the previous year's revenue, the governor shall notify the minister, so that's the minister of finance, and parliament in attainment of the limit under subsection 2, and the minister upon notification shall again report to parliament on the remedial measures that are meant to be taken. This is in the act. Mm. That's it. And uh, all of this have not been done. No, right Interesting. All of this have not no. been done. Interesting. Let's go to John. John, how do you react to this? Um, uh, including <coughs> what appears to be clear, you know, if you like, breaches of the law with such impunity. Uh, yeah, something. Thank you very much. Uh, let me. Uh, respond to some of the issues raised by, by both uh, Honorable Adongo and uh, Dr. Tiu. Uh, on the issue of um, uh, Honorable Adongo, he's talking about targets versus reality. And for him, anytime the difference is a problem between our targets and our reality, we should go for reality. And if he takes that position, then he must agree with government that indeed we are turning the corner and that uh, the reality is that the first quarter growth of uh, 2023 was 4.2%. So on the issues of standards of measurement that he talks about using end of year GDP to measure the debt levels, this is not new to the way government has done accounting in Ghana. Uh, if you take all our previous uh, budget, this has been the formula that has been used and approved by parliament consistently. So it's not a new thing. He also read the PFM Act and then started to say that the PFM Act, if there's any provision in the PFM Act that is inconsistent with any other law, then the PFM Act will supersede that law or those other laws. And I want to caution him that he cannot take that position because the, the Bank of Ghana is a constitutional body and its creation is subject to the constitution of the land. So he must so, know that so, there are other So you are you are invoking provision. you are invoking a constitutional provision. I'm saying that he cannot take that position. Yeah, yeah. So tell us related. tell us the specific you know, the, not, tell us the specific the principle the specific uh, the specific the authority that you are relying on to vary this provision which says where there is a conflict or inconsistency between the provisions of this act and any other relevant enactment, the provisions of this act shall prevail. And I'm saying that Article 2 of the 1992 Constitution has also provided that any law that is inconsistent with the provisions of the Constitution is to the extent of inconsistency for it. So you are saying, don't rely only on this. So you are, you are saying this is inconsistent you, with, the, uh, with the constitutional provisions governing the Bank of Ghana's functions? Exactly, when he has not examined those laws. So, he okay. be careful so, he so wait, that wait, John. John, you are introducing a new thing okay. that may take us. No, wait, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'll give you the opportunity. But okay. if you say that, if you say that a provision of the act is inconsistent with the constitution, and to the extent of that inconsistency, the law says it will be void, null and void. Remember that it is not your say so. You have to take a writ to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court must declare that this provision should not apply. Until and unless that has happened, this will continue to be the law. Well, I, I, I don't want to go on that tangent. You know, we are lawyers. 
we have different interpretations. No, no, you have breached. So you have breached the that, law. No, if, if what you are saying, no. if what you are saying is what you are saying, then you have breached the law with impunity, and you can't claim that by your no, interpretation. No, we have not breached. The no, law. you cannot say it's that. Let me. You let are me not. My no, no, John, hold on. I'll give you time. You we cannot say that. You cannot say that by your interpretation, this provision is inconsistent you, with the constitution. Something. I didn't speak to my interpretation. I spoke to the general law he spoke. Okay. That any law inconsistent with PFM Act to the extent of inconsistency will be void. And I said that is not correct in, uh, in relation to the Constitution. And I've quoted Article 2 of the Constitution to make that point. This is just general. Yes, and, and I'm saying, and I'm saying now, that, I'm saying that we ought to educate the public correctly. If you are quoting the provision of the Constitution that you have quoted, you cannot do that by your say so. Not even the Attorney General, not even the Chief Justice can wake up one day and say, the, the law says I should do X, Y. My reading of that law suggests that it is inconsistent okay. with the Constitution. And to that extent, so I cannot apply that law. <laughs> Unless you have taken a writ to the court and the court has struck down the provision, it is the law and must be complied with. That's the education I was the constitution to say that you should look at right. Okay. Off. All right. I don't agree with you on that, but Oh, you, you cannot disagree with That's me on my that. Point John. Is that. John John, we are both trained as lawyers. No, you cannot disagree, disagree with, with me on that. Sorry? I, I totally disagree with you on that. You totally disagree I with totally me. I totally disagree with you on that. That's that allow me to explain why I disagree with you. Uh-huh. Yes, I disagree with you. So just allow me to explain. No, 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 no. You can't disagree with me in a vacuum. That a law has been made by parliament. You take a view that that provision, uh, there's a provision that is inconsistent with the constitution. And therefore, it should not be enforced without a Supreme Court pronouncement but what is even the or, the, the or parliament repealing it. <coughs> what does it mean, the provision in the constitution? Okay, go on. Go on. Go on with your point. Without coming to parliament. Go, go on with your point. I think I have given the public that education. That not even the president of the republic can get up one day and say a law made by parliament instructs him to do one thing he disagrees with that law because that law as far as he is concerned is inconsistent with the constitution and therefore he will not comply with that law the president does not have that power he must go to the supreme court and tell the supreme court that he disagrees with that law because he thinks it is, it is inconsistent with the Constitution. And he must wait for the Supreme Court to say, we agree with you. Until that is done, the President is bound by that law. Until Parliament has repealed that law, or the Court has struck it down, it remains the laws of Ghana. That's all the education I sought to give. So John, please go ahead and make your point. But there's no set provision. It's clearly position. different from all the things you are saying, because that is not what I sought to imply. I have not said that the president can wake up one day and say that uh, this law is inconsistent with the constitution and I'm doing what I like. I haven't said that. That is your position. The point I'm seeking to make is that the issue of a loss of 80 billion by the Bank of Ghana is a question of an, account, an accounting problem which has uh, resulted in impairment of several banks in Ghana. It is not only the Bank of Ghana we are talking about. We are talking about other commercial banks which have also suffered a lot of impairment losses on their bank, on their balance sheets. And so this is a question of accounting, okay? And how, what has been the precedent? How has uh, commercial losses of banks been treated in the past? This is not a new thing, and it's not only subject to Ghana. Almost all central banks and other banks, commercial banks around the world, suffer impairment of their losses one way or the other. And this is in respect of the domestic debt exchange that took place in Ghana. And how is the accounting procedure done? Is it required for the Bank of Ghana to go to Parliament for an accounting procedure in writing up a debt or a loss on their balance sheet? This is subject to precedence. So let us not change the nature of the, of the problem and bring, set our own questions and say, bring it under PFM to say you have to go to Parliament. If we have to go to Parliament, there are several other laws that allow the finance minister to go to parliament to even seek to remedy financial transactions. So let us be very careful how we jump to conclusions to say that somebody didn't do the right thing. 
But on this particular issue, it's a question of accounting and, and impairment, uh, 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 what, what do you call it, uh, loss on the, on the balance sheet of not just Bank of Ghana, but several other banks in the country. How are losses or impairment on balance sheets of, of banks treated in this country? Is it an accounting issue? If it's an accounting issue, the, 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 what is the precedent on how impairment and losses on balance sheets are treated in our country? This is all that I'm trying to say. I haven't said that if we disagree with any law, we will give our own interpretation and work with that. So let's be very clear on that one. Now, the issue that um, Dr. Thieu has raised about the 2022 mid-year targets and what finally turn out in the end of the year. I mean, uh, let's try and put that uh, discussion in context because we know that uh, towards the end of the year, uh, first of all, let me state that central bank financing under the new IMF program that we are doing is currently zero. So we don't have the opportunity to even do the 5% of previous year's revenue as stated in the banking act. So this year is totally different from last year. But let me try and bring into perspective the discussions on how the scenario that uh, Dr. Tew talks about happened. I mean, we all know that towards the end of the last year, um, Ghana, because of our downward ratings, didn't have access to capital market. And so we could not bring in external finance. And, and, and much of the, of the support that we were doing Uh, I'm, John, I'm losing you. Uh, I'm losing John. Okay, I'll, I'll take a break at this point. Um, uh, Awal Muhammad said, if the economy has turned the corner, then how come still goods and services are skyrocketing the prices? Today, a bag of beans in a Jura market is almost uh, 100, is it uh, 1,100 Ghana cities. The hardship uh, keeps rising. Uh, Compari says the economy might not seem the way we want, but let's hope for a better future. Uh, Pray for Ghana says, unfortunately, Ghana can't seem to be anywhere near the corner. Government claiming to have turned after a whole central bank has made a staggering loss of 60 billion. Please kindly inform me when those responsible are indicted. Uh, Mick Tart says, what real impact have those minimal improvements on the economic figures on business and livelihood? And Kea Mofa, any time politicians are explaining themselves over statements they have made, then they are either lying or trying to throw dust into the eyes of the public. Sound policies do not need multiple explanations. We'll be right back. The 20 million dollars uh, uh, had been spent already, yet they were only able to produce only 1,500 who were not habitable. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the, the estimates they provided for off-site infrastructure alone, we needed 46 million dollars to provide off-site infrastructure. Now, apart from that, there are on-site works. Okay. Mm -hmm. These 1,005 units that are at various stages of completion. If some had deteriorated, needed to fix some of them and all that. The estimate was that from AESO, you needed almost, it was $29 million. There is a serious uh, sewage system there that was not fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, that one is 8,000. So you are looking there's at almost serious, $100 million. Dollars. There's a serious uh, drainage challenge without which it 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 will be very difficult to live there. That one is five million dollars. So the on-site works alone, mm -hmm. including you know some amenities which will make it possible for people to live there, like a school, like you know, because thousand five hundred. If you put people there and you don't build a school, <laughs> it, 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 it will not make sense mm -hmm. exactly. So when you put all that together, it was going to cut the state one hundred and forty million dollars. 140 million no dollars to be able to revive the Saglami affordable housing project. And even with that, look at the distance. It's two, more than two and a half hours from Accra. 
Right. So I start with you, uh, Dr. Theo Champong. Straight away, we have very limited time. So what can you say about what is going on? The government says because it will cost some 140 million to make the Saglime housing project habitable. The project, um, it lacked proper feasibility studies, like you have heard the minister also suggest here. But those who did it said, we want to decongest Accra. Uh, if you are finding a new place, it must, it must cost you money. And you do that, and then uh, that begins to generate a place which is fertile for people to come in. So why are we suddenly saying, because it will cost this much, we won't uh, proceed to complete the process, and we are launching a new project, 8,000 uh, 8, units in Greater Accra, Pokwase, uh, and uh, 6,000 units in Ashanti region, uh, which project we are told is going to cost government 47 million, while the private entities will take up the rest of the cost. I don't know how much is the rest of the cost. Yes, Dr. Chiyachampo. Something, thank you. Uh, I will answer that, but I beg you just give me one minute just to respond to Honorable's point uh, that he made uh, earlier. That uh, I, I fundamentally agree with him when he says that it is an accounting problem. It is not just an accounting problem. It is also a legal problem and a legal issue. Because you see, the other, yeah. banks, the other commercial yeah. banks operate outside of the remit of the Bank of Ghana. The Bank of Ghana is a creature of statute. And there are laws and regulations that guide its actions. So even when it comes to accounting treatment and all of that, it's got to be subject to the laws that set up the Bank of Ghana. So okay. I, so what I, can I you say in three minutes? What can you say about so, the uh, Sagleme and the new project discussion? Yeah. So so Sagleme is is an interesting one. What I don't get is why we often don't complete projects and where in a rush to cut new ones, establish new ones, when these old ones can, you know, very well uh, do, do the job. Um, it's a political economy question and imperative as well. Of course, the minister says that they need 114 million or so to get it up to scratch. Um, but uh, um, I, I presume that it is possible to use some tax incentives and, and other measures to get investors to go in um, uh, and to complete those projects mm. while at the same time we build new um, you know, homes. The, the point is that we have a major housing deficit. No two ways about that. We need to do something about it. Mm. The cost of the housing needs to come down. And what is affordable, according to some of the numbers and the estimates I've seen from the literature, maybe about $30,000 to, to forty or something thousand. So the new homes that have been built, what was commissioned recently, that is a positive. We commend the government for that. But the idea of doing different projects and one government comes and there's no continuity with projects and all of that, I think that's something that we need to... The, um, the PPA, Public Procurement policy. Authority, has given the green light for you know, a private investor to be sought after to take over the 1,500 units that have been done, uh, which we have spent... Two million dollars already on. Uh, this is a, a, a 300 acre land that we're hoping to do 5,000 residential unit facilities there. If you give it to a private person, are you not shortchanging yourself that you don't want to spend the extra money that is 140 to bring the facilities? That will make the place um, like the water, the electricity. If the private person is able to bring these things there, the rest of the housing to be constructed, that will obviously become very cheap because the cost would have gone down, correct? Um, yes, but also there's a question of innovation. So what does the private sector bring that the government does not bring in terms of technology, the financing? You know, we're talking about a government that needs to balance its books and cut expenditure and all of that. Um, I think there's room and scope for private sector participation. And in fact, that is what we should be pushing and um, advocating a lot more of to solve the housing crisis. That is not to say that the government cannot be involved. The government can use 
policy can use tax, can even set up special purpose vehicles. Look at what state housing company is doing. Fantastic. We need to complement. We need yeah. to push them. Yeah, to those do guys are doing quite that. a great job there. They cannot, state housing <laughs> cannot solve all of the problems. Mm. You need the private sector as part of that mix. Are you, are you mm -hmm. surprised, because you brought that up, are you surprised that these things, when they come up, we are not allowing the state uh, housing to be doing it? State housing, as we see, they are doing cheaper housing around the place, a very quality homes. And here we are, we sink, you know, millions of dollars into some private hands. When the state housing guys are doing better and cheaper homes, you know, for, for Ghanaians. So quickly to that, it's a combination. You have a 1.5 million unit housing deficit in the country. There's no way in the next 10 years that state housing can accomplish all of that, even if we decided to build, you know, 100,000 units uh, every year. So definitely you need the private sector in that. It's a question of what incentives do we give? One, how do we ensure that the private sector guys are building quality homes? So it's an issue of supervision, the issue of regulation, mm. all of those things come okay. into play. All right, thank you very much. Yes, uh, Isaac, now it's, yeah. it's surprising. People feel this thing, and I feel it as a citizen. Mm that, like um, I mentioned in my introduction, Kufo started an uh, affordable housing unit, NDC came, then there was initial abandonment, right? whatever the justification that may come. Now, you leave things to rot, like the Seglume place. We know things are getting rotting, they are breaking some of the you know, glasses, they are stealing from them, and then we're now going to sell to a private you know, company, cheaper, and then they'll take advantage and make money. Yes, uh, something I agree, but briefly let me do this. Uh, I want Kuma to know that there's a difference between write-off and impairment. Impairments are accounting treatment of revalued financial assets. And they only materialize on a, at the point when you, they become mature or you redeem them and you don't get the full value. In that case, it's a market dictate. There is no need for you to come to parliament and say that, look, I gave a financial instrument of 100 million, but when I went to the market, it is for 70 million. That's different. That is impairment. But I'm talking about write off. That's why I didn't mention 48 billion. I mentioned 32 billion. So you should understand the two. The two are different. I'm not talking impairment. And even the impairment of the private sector is dictated by the company's own regulations. And it is dictated by its board mm. and what policies the board will work to get approval. Okay. But when it comes to Bank of Ghana, the approval is quite clear that it is stated here. Okay. And you need that approval. So that's what yeah, I want to say. There's a about. statement uh, under the hand of Felix Kwachi um, Ofosu on this development. It says, in a bid to justify the abandonment of some projects bequeathed uh, President Akufuado by President Mahama, MPP supporters have resorted to claims that the latter abandoned affordable housing projects started by President Kufu. Fact, please. It says, the pictures, then he gives some pictures, uh, uh, belie these claims. These pictures were taken on the 22nd of July, 2016, and we may show them to you briefly. And they showed the progress of work on 1,478 housing units at Botteman after they were handed over to SNIT for completion. So that's what the NDC did. President Ford started a total of 4,720 affordable housing units in 2006. They were located in the Greater Accra region, as something northern and upper east, upper east and west regions, as well as eastern regions, to ensure their completion. The entire site and 1,526 housing units was allocated to the Tema Development Corporation for completion. Out of this number, 216 units were allocated to the Ghana Police Service for completion. Work was progressing satisfactorily. When President Mahama left office, the Ghana Armed Forces, which was also allocated six blocks of 48 housing units at the same site, had since completed them for occupation. Arrangements were also far, far advanced for the completion of the Sokore Mampon, Kufuridia, Tamale, and Wa projects. Any claim that President Mahama abandoned uh, these uh, units is false. Well, interesting. Uh, I've got just about 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah. I mean, uh, Felix has said it all. Uh, 
we didn't abandon the project even though we couldn't complete all. But it just doesn't make sense to say that somebody did the wrong thing, so I'm also doing the wrong thing. If that is, that is even anything to go by. These are public funds. And it is important for you to bring them to the point where they can be useful to the citizens of Ghana. But something, I just want to throw a challenge, my colleague. If you can quote any provision in the Constitution that says Bank of Ghana can just write off mm. 32 billion, mm. then it would have been conflicted with these provisions that are quoted. I see. Uh, interesting, the Isaac Adongo ending the show for us um, on that note. Uh, but questions are being asked, like uh, the wise saying, did I say the wise saying, like the scripture instructs? Something. Who is it that, yes, John, I, I'm sorry, but yes, we have run I'm, out of time. We are completely yes, out of time. We lost you. Uh, uh, yes, I've been, on, I've been on for a long time. Um, well, my friends want some quotations. Maybe you should read Article 179. Uh, of the Constitution, Article 180 and 181, you will understand that uh, the, the central bank is also positioned to take decisions in the economic interest and progress of the country. Mm. But I feel as it may, if there are legal issues, the government always has a legal advisor, and we will look at the legal implications. Parliament is always there. Uh, the fin finances in Ghana is the only activities that you are required right. you can john, even john john forgive us uh, very unfortunate forgive us but our time is up and this has been news file i'm samson ladia Nyanini, and my guests have been john kuma you also heard uh, theo champong and isaac adongo uh, have a good afternoon uh, tomorrow 2 p.m join me on the law show uh, with a group of lawyers as we look at the role of the attorney general in prosecutions